All right. Um, nice to see you, even if only virtually, everyone. Sorry, I can't be there in person, but uh, I'll do my best to keep an eye on the chat. So feel free to heckle me over there. Uh, my name's Ryan. I'm on the software engineering team at Harrison AI. Uh, and if you take a look around the big spiral staircase in the room there with you, you'll see that our mission at Harrison is to uh, improve the standard of healthcare for millions of lives a day. And we do it by building uh, world leading AI models. And I want to tell you today a little story about how Rust is starting to help us uh, execute on that mission. Uh, this is uh, based on some work that we did for commercial purposes, so I'm not going to be able to give you all of the, the details, obviously. It'll be a lightly fictionalized account, but I hope to give you a little bit of a, a vibe and a sense of the journey that we went through trying to use Rust when dealing with petabytes of data uh, for one of our model building projects. So the starting conditions are uh, one of our ventures had happened to come by a few petabytes of de-identified medical imaging data, right? the sort of stuff that is really great raw input to building medical AI models. But the bad news is that this data was distributed more or less at random across a couple of million individual TAR archives. And if you've ever worked with a TAR archive, uh, you'll know that they're very good for moving data around from one place to another, but they're not really that good uh, at being able to inspect and work with the data they're in, right? They're a pretty opaque kind of blob of data. So in order to put that data to use, um, we had to figure out what was inside those tarballs, basically make them available to some sort of uh, big cloud database. Uh, in our case, we're using Amazon's Athena. Now, Athena is pretty amazing, right? It, it's sort of a, a big cloud database designed for uh, querying data at rest in, in a cloud storage provider like S3. And it can read uh, Parquet files, it can read JSON files, it can read things in various compressed formats. Unfortunately, can't read tarballs full of de-identified medical image data. So we had to find a way to generate some sort of index of those files, right? Process the tarballs, turn them into some data that Amazon Athena could use uh, to let us see what's in there and decide which files we wanted to work with in what order. Um, now, we actually had a few sort of failed attempts at this, including one very unfortunate incident where we sent too much data to Amazon Kinesis Firehose and it started dropping things. Ask me about it when I'm there in person um, over beers one time. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, what we settled on was to try and do basically the simplest thing that could possibly work at scale, right? So we wanted to take each one of those millions of TAR archives, process it using a scalable compute uh, function in AWS Lambda, and turn it into just a plain JSON lines file describing the contents of that archive. Right? If we got to JSON lines files sitting in cloud storage in Amazon S3, then we had something that Amazon Athena could read. And from there, we could use all of the big data processing capabilities of Athena to uh, sort and summarize and compress that data into some smaller indexes that would help us uh, navigate our way around those tarballs. Now, this is not a big data talk. I'm not going to go into too many of the things on the right-hand side of that uh, diagram. But let's take a little look at this uh, kind of first step, right? the indexing piece, where we want to be able to take a look at each of those millions of tarballs and spit out some data about what it contains. Now, that's the sort of thing that uh, sort of for, for a lot of people you could reach for just about your favorite programming language, uh, spin up enough copies of it in a cloud compute environment like AWS Lambda, and it would probably do the job. So when we sat down to look at this, right, probably the go-to language for, for our team would have been Python. Uh, and in fact, I've put together a little Python demo here of the core logic that we wanted to use on top of these tarballs, right? At, at the end of the day, what we wanted to be able to do was take the path to a tar file, open it, iterate over its contents, right? spit out JSON lines of like, the files that we found therein, right? So uh, in real life, like this was a lot more complicated, right? We wanted to parse out like details about what patients had what files and this sort of thing. But the core logic of like open up a tarball, rummage around inside it, write out what you find, um, it was at the heart of this system. Uh, and if we did this in Python, like it would have worked, but all of the folks on the team at the time, like we were pretty keen to give Rust a try. Like we hoped that we would be able to get some better performance out of it. We hoped we'd be able to get uh, perhaps some better robustness out of it. And this seemed like a really nice opportunity, sort of self-contained uh, uh, problem space in which to explore it. So let's have a look at what a Rust version of that core logic would look like. Um, and Unfortunately, Rust doesn't have like tar file handling and, and JSON handling built in, but there are some pretty common dependencies that you can use to pull those in, right? Tar, crate, um, Serde, if you're doing anything in, uh, in Rust with JSON, you want Serde. We need to do a little bit of boilerplate setup, right? In, in order to write out index entries, you'd have a, a little struct that we define uh, with Serde's serialize helper just to help spit things out. But at the end of the day, like that processing loop in Rust 
it operates at pretty much the same level of abstraction as it does in Python, right? You open the tarball, you open your output file, you iterate over each of the entries, you write out some, some data about it, right? And um, I think like being able to, to kind of take a go at this in Rust and have something that looks and feels at the same level of abstraction as we would in a high level language was pretty exciting um, for us as, a, as an early uh, starting point, right? In, engaging with this problem space. Um, one thing that we noticed very quickly was that Rust was pointing out to us a lot of places where things could go silently wrong in other versions such as Python, right? Here, Rust is kindly letting us know that the file names in a tar archive might not be UTF-8, right? And we need to deal with that error. Um, so before we got too carried away with trying to do anything further with that, right? Let's take a quick look at this, right? Is this actually gonna be uh, any, an interesting expedition? So I did a quick benchmark using this tool uh, called Hyperfine, which is a little benchmarking tool written in Rust. Um, this is the, the Python uh, demo that I showed you earlier, right? It runs in about uh, 345 milliseconds for some sample data that I have. If I run the Rust version of that, it, um, sorry, slower, no, one second. Compile in release mode, right? Then we can benchmark uh, the Rust version against the Python version. And we find that it runs like a little bit quicker, not a lot quicker, but a little bit. Um, I actually, when putting the slides together and after the Deep, uh, benchmarking and release mode incident. Uh, got, got a bit carried away and tried to dig in and optimize that code, like removed some temporary temporary string allocations and that sort of thing. And I managed to get that down uh, to like running in, you know, a bit of two and a half times faster than the Python version, which I think is, is pretty good, right? There's code operating at a similarly high level of abstraction, but because of the nature of Rust and the way that it sort of gives us more control over the allocation of resources, um, we kind of get substantially better performance more or less for free, which is pretty cool. Um, this is not a talk about you know minute optimizations of uh, of uh, Rust code. So the next step was to go from there to actually working with data in AWS. And for Rust, that gets a little bit thorny. Um, so this is where we started to get a little bit complicated because Rust has a lot of high quality crates for working with AWS, right? There's a crate for uh, reading and writing files in S3. There's a crate for connecting your Rust functions to Lambda. The thing about all of these crates is that they're all async. All of the networking stuff in, in Rust uses uh, async functions. And so we also had to go and find new async versions of all of the crates that we're using for the basic demo version. Um, because everything inside of our AWSified version of this function will need to be async. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, this was a little bit of an adventure, right? Async Rust is pretty hard to, to get your head around when you dig in for the first time. Um, but kind of working through some of the issues and learning a little bit about uh, streams and futures, we actually managed to come up with some code that we were pretty happy with. Um, so, you know, in uh, uh, in order to uh, read a tarball from S3 and uh, iterate through its entries, actually, like the Rust AWS uh, S3 SDK has a pretty nice wrapper where you can get an object if you give it a bucket and a key, and you can turn it into what Rust calls an async read trait, right? Which basically lets you read the bytes out of that uh, file in a streaming manner. You can pass that to the async tar uh, crate and, and it will let you sort of do a very low memory usage efficient streaming read through the entries in that tar file, which is pretty nice. Uh, unfortunately, what that means is that where we previously had just a nice little iterator of entries from the tarball, we now had this thing called a stream. Uh, and if you've done any work in async Rust, uh, you may have encountered these things. They're a little bit more awkward to work with. You can't just iterate over them with, with a for loop. Um, you can do a little while loop like this, which is not too bad. Um, but we did have a lot of fun trying to find all of the various helper methods on the stream traits. So here, uh, for example, I'm uh, iterating through the contents of that tarball uh, one at a time using this trifold method. Um, basically capturing all of the, the rows that we're trying to write there as JSON into a VEC so that we can then write them out again to S3. So I'm not gonna lie, like we spent quite a bit of time trying to find out the details, like how to work with streams and how to make this uh, sort of kind of fit in our heads. But once we got our heads around it, and once we came to understand how to use these try stream act methods and the various helper methods on a stream, uh, you kind of feel like a wizard, right? Like you can, you can sort of write super efficient streaming read code uh, like this, which is pretty cool. Um, and then fortunately for us, right, pretty uh, straightforward helper library to write stuff back out again to S3. Um, so what I, what I want to kind of get across there um, is that the core logic there, even in this async talking to AWS Rust version, was actually pretty 
high level, like pretty easy to follow, right? We kind of read the tarball from S3 and process the archives one at a time, and then we can write the data back out again to, to S3. Um, the process of hooking that up to be a Lambda is a little bit fiddly, right? There's a crate called uh, Lambda Runtime, which will help you do this. And we actually have a little crate of our own called Cobalt AWS, uh, which has got some kind of helper logic in it. Um, the core idea here being basically that you can uh, have a callback that handles a single message, right? And you can do a little bit of Rust boilerplate and hook it up into a, a function that will handle a, a stream of messages coming off, say, an SQS queue or a Lambda function invocation. Um, now, that little bit of Rust code, right? if you go through the motions of compiling it into a Docker image, um, you can send it off into AWS Lambda and run that as a function one time, 10 times, or in our case, millions of times. Uh, and that's uh, thanks to kind of Cargo and Rust's pretty convenient uh, build ecosystem. This was actually really straightforward. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, like much, much simpler than I've ever had a time of sort of packaging Python packages in the past. Um, the one thing to watch out for here, if you're deploying into AWS, is that they tend to suggest that you compile for ARM64 instead of x86-64 um, because that is cheaper to run in the Lambda environment. Um, so the docs say anyway, I actually put that to the test for this example code. Uh, and uh, here are some rough performance numbers essentially of that demo code uh, running over some, some example tar archives. Like the naive Python version, uh, you know, 14.5 seconds uh, to process one of those files on x86. And as Amazon suggested, like a little bit faster to run uh, on their ARM64 processors. Interestingly, the Rust code, when we ran it on x86-64, was consistently a little bit faster than when run on the ARM64 processors. But because those processors are cheaper, it actually turns out that yes, the recommended architecture for, uh, for Rust was still the cheapest option. Um, now that's sort of a, a, a very whirlwind demo of the kind of code that we're trying to work with here and sort of what you can expect if you try to dive into this sort of thing. Um, in the in real life version of this, it was of course a little more complicated, right? We weren't just listing the files in the archives, we're sort of generating, I think, six different listings of, of different kinds of files that you might find in those tables and the metadata about each. We were writing out the files in a particular format by organized by prefix to help them be queryable by Athena. Um, Rust actually had some really good support for doing transparent uh, compression with Z standard, thanks to some async read and async write traits. Um, but at the end of the day, by a combination of the performance that we got out of Rust and the memory usage we got out of Rust, like running this in production sort of cost on the order of a few hundred dollars in Lambda execution time. Now we didn't do a full run of a, of a different language for comparison, obviously, but from what I've seen, like I'm pretty confident that the, the Python version of that, if we'd done one, would have been an order of magnitude more expensive. So it felt like a, a pretty good uh, little experiment, right? At the end of the day, we managed to sneak some rust in here. And when we ran it in production, um, when we finally sort of shook all the bugs out of the system and deployed and ran it at scale, it was honestly a little bit of a, uh, an anti-climax. Like it ran, it did the, it did the job, uh, and it finished, I think, in, in less than a day. Uh, and we were happy. We were able to process those files with Athena. We were able to see what was in them. We were able to start using that uh, data to, to do some model building. Um, so we really liked the runtime performance that we got out of using Rust for this, but to be honest, like it wasn't that much of a difference, right? You know, you kind of a few hundred dollars here and there. What was really impressive for us, I think, was the stable memory usage that you get out of using something like Rust rather than a scripting language like Python, because it means that you can run these functions on smaller uh, Lambda instances. And when you're doing compute uh, in an environment like Lambda, you actually pay for memory usage as well as just CPU time. Um, I think one of our operations guys actually watching these Rust Lambdas run for the first time commented that he'd basically never seen a Lambda run that steadily, right, or with that consistently low memory usage. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. Uh, we really uh, overall enjoyed the, uh, the runtime robustness of doing this work in Rust, right? Like it sort of forced us to think through a lot of the error cases up front. Uh, and it really was the case that when we came to run this stuff in production, uh, it pretty much just worked, which, which was incredible. Um, on the other hand, some things that we found were pretty challenging. I think the, the async ecosystem is still a little bit fragmented, right? We sort of had to find async equivalents of some of the crates we were using. Um, we had a little bit of a challenge with some testing some of the AWS services, although I will say we got some good mileage out of a, of a product called LocalStack, which lets you do uh, sort of mocking at local uh, hosted services of various AWS services. Um, and the one comment I have on things that were challenging were actually when you're working with Rust or you're working with streams, 
and you're kind of feeling like a wizard and, and you can use all of the, the cool features that Rust offers you. There are a lot of optimization opportunities in there that turn out to be an attractive nuisance, right? And one of the challenges we had was actually like knowing to, when to put down the brush and kind of just ship what we had and let it cost maybe $200 instead of $100 uh, and get on with our lives. Um, but overall, like I said, this was a bit of an experiment in seeing how Rust would, would work out for this kind of use case and will we do it again? Absolutely. Right. And it's in fact something that we're trying to make a core competency for our team here at Harrison. Um, trying to open source what we can. So if you are interested in doing uh, some AWS related things in Rust, we have a, a high level uh, wrapper library for AWS, which lets us do uh, sort of more, uh, kind of wraps the, the lower level AWS SDK APIs into things like async reads and streams. Um, to really make working at that higher level of abstraction a bit more convenient. We're also publishing some of the Docker-based build tooling, uh, if that's something that's interesting to you. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, flesh out even more things on this slide over time. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, I think we're, we're prepared to make a pretty big bet on Rust, the combination of sort of uh, forcing you to think through your problem up front a little bit, right? Uh, th this notion of uh, if it compiles, it works super uh, predictable performance in production makes it a really good fit for working with this sort of data um, in AWS at scale. Uh, so that was a little bit of a whirlwind tour. Happy to take any questions and uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you for, uh, for joining us at the Harrison office and I hope they're treating you well there. So any questions? Um, we'll relay them to Discord, and Ryan is going to be on the screen back. So any questions? No questions? Uh, hi. Uh, just a bit curious about how big was the team and how long it took you to be there and to build the whole uh, so I have a question in Discord here about how long it took to build. Do you mean like the compile time of the software itself or the messing around with Rust to understand it for the first time? Uh, so this, in fact, was a team of uh, three people. I think at least one of them is in the room there uh, this evening, I believe. Uh, Tim, if you're keeping an eye out for him. Um, and uh, so I came to the team with a little bit of experience with, uh, with Rust. Uh, I think we were sort of all Rust, Rust curious at the least. But they're, like, not going to lie, it was certainly a, a learning curve, right? I, I don't think the cost saving that we would have realized this time around would have would have paid for the engineer hours of learning to get up to speed with Rust. But we're pretty excited about how those skills are going to compound over time, right? As we do more and more of this in more and more parts of our data processing pipeline, uh, you know, sort of those baseline skills and patterns that we've started to develop, I think they're really going to pay off over time. Uh, and nine names in the chat here. I agree it is super hard to resist optimizing every little detail of things when you're working with Rust. <laughs> 